Hello, beautiful, wonderful West Virginia. I'm Brian Marshalsi, Mrs. Esther Moray's father, a triple Holocaust survivor, to speak to you today about the possibilities of being a successful person when all the odds are against you. And I mean all the odds that you do not have to be the victim of circumstances the rest of your life and, my friend, you do not have to be the victim of a peer pressure group that plays games with you, that uses you like a toy or like a puppet. You can be your own person and chart your own course. So. Here's my story with all the odds against me. I was born in Nazi Germany. Being of Jewish descent, it was eventually decided by the German government that all those of Jewish descent should be killed. And so, in the end time, the last few years, they set up concentration camps with gas chambers. Six million Jews were killed, one and a half million were killed in gas chambers. The Jews were put into these shower rooms, they had to undress. Men in one room, women in another big shower room, they were told they're going to get a shower. And then, but instead of water coming out of the shower heads, it was cycling pea gas, and within three to four minutes, all of them were dead. Immediately, they were put into the crematory, were burned, and that was the end of that. Other millions of Jews were killed by execution squads. They had to bury, dig their own graves, stand in front of the graves, and they were mowed down with machine guns. Other millions of Jews were killed by gas vans, vans like pickup trucks, but closed vans, picked them up, they were put in there, and then the exhaust gas of the motor would go into the van and they would die that way. So the government of Germany had death on its mind for my life. Does the government of the United States have a plan to kill you? No. So you're better off than I was. <laughs> then the British tried to kill us, but that's war. But uh, it's the way it was. I survived 1,000 bombing raids by the British Air Force. I lived in Hamburg, the second largest city in Germany. We lived on the fifth floor of an apartment complex. And every night, once, two, or sometimes three times a night, the sirens would go off. And we would go from the fifth floor all the way down to the basement bunker in total darkness, be jammed in there and hoping we wouldn't get hit that night. Actually, eventually, my building was hit in 1943 by Operation Gomorrah by the British Air Force and that night all my neighbors were killed, 42,000 people were dead the next morning, burned alive by the firebombs, buried under the rubble, or asphyxiated. So, but just before that bombing raid, I moved, my parents, our family moved from Hamburg and West Germany to a town called Landburg in East Germany. Now, here my father got a job away from home. He had spent five, six days, six, actually six days, uh, away from home in a condominium in a rental place. His landlady, stole his food rations, he got thinner and thinner, got tuberculosis, and he died. He was one that kept the Nazis off our stairs so far. So when he died, right after he died, my mother went to his desk drawer and found two loaded revolvers. He was going to meet the Nazis at the door if they'd come and get his Jewish family. So then, in addition to that, tragedy, the Russians were coming. 
And this is what the Russians did when they came into Germany. This is reported from the first village they entered. The Nazis took it back, the Germans took it back. And this is what they found. All old men had been clubbed to death. All babies had their heads, heads crushed. And all females from 8 to 80 had been abused, tied to wagon wheels and the barn doors. When that got on the radio, 12 million Germans walked out of their homes into the deep snow to flee westward away from the advancing Russian army to be spared this humiliation. We were part of those 12 million people. Now, then on top of this, a baby was born just before the Russians took our town that made things even more difficult. So, then we got onto a train to get away. We only took our clothing, whatever we wore. We took no food. We had no food to take with us. We had no extra clothing, nothing. So we got into a Red Cross train loaded with wounded soldiers and what was supposed to take two hours from where we were to where we were supposed to go, a port city of Danzig and Dansk. We were standing in this train, body to body, packed in there like sardines for three days and three nights. We buried the dead soldiers that died doing the transport, no medication, there was of course no food, there was no water, and uh, we just ate snow whenever the train stopped. Then, when we got to this town, Danzig, we soon were sur surrounded by the Russian army, except for the sea, the Baltic Sea was behind us. We still had an open end to, uh, for ships to come in to take people out. Then we were two million of us, and then uh, every day our space got smaller, we were being bombed, and then finally my brother and I found a ship loading up refugees in the harbor. And so we inquired and we were able to get on the ship because we had a baby, that was the only ticket, only families with babies could get on the ship, no men were allowed on it, some men dressed like women, they were shot by the SS and their bodies were hung on lampposts. This ship was so crowded, again body to body, we were made to lay down on a steel riveted floor, body to body, and we were on the ship for three and a half days. Then we ended up in Denmark where we were taken into a camp uh, behind barbed wire for two years uh, with 36,000 people, 17 people in one room. As you know now by this time, of course, we had nothing but the clothes in the back. We wore the same clothes for two years in this camp. My baby sister died of starvation with other 1,000 children whose mothers also did not have food and could not produce the milk to keep the babies going. So in this camp, I want to tell you something, in this camp, nobody ever complained. We all were happy because of what we still had. What did we have? Well, we began to recognize what we had was all we needed to be successful in life. We were told to be glad. We had hands by which to handle things. We had feet by which to walk. We had eyes by which to see. We had ears by which to hear. And we had a working brain. And it's all portable. So we learned in this camp not to take inventory of what we wanted to have, what we didn't have, but to take inventory of what we did have. And so another thing we were happy about, that we had green bread. Every day we ate green bread, molded bread, and it was always wet. We had to squeeze the water out. Now, you say, how could you be happy about that? 
We were happy because there were 18 million people who wished they had green bread so they could live, but they died of starvation. 18 million people. So, I had a wonderful mother. She was always positive. And I want to encourage you to be compositive. Always look at the best things that, or what you actually have. Look at what you actually have and be grateful to it for it. Do not allow the negatives to get in your life. That weakens you, that brings darkness into your life, and that brings anger into your life and resentment. Count your blessings, name them one by one, and see what the Lord has done. So we were in his camp, and then make the best of the situation. Here we were boys, I was 11 years, 9 to 11 years of age. We uh, became creative with what we had. We had some trees there. We carved chess figures out of trees, and I played chess six days a week. It's good for the brain. The second year in this camp, we, uh, the parents got together and said, we need to give our kids an education. We are 36,000, we got a bunch of brains here. And so they started elementary school, high school and university without textbooks, without notebooks, without pencils. We just had a school teacher, we all lived in barracks. He had a piece of chalk, a chalkboard, and everything was done by memory. Oh, it was a good time. The first thing, though, that we had to learn in school was a great German hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, A Bulwark Never Failing. Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott, ein gute Wehr und Waffen. So I lay on the top bunk night after night, and I would say to myself, who is God? Where is God? How does he fit in? Why am I here? I began to grapple with the three biggest questions of life. Origin, purpose, and destiny. But I couldn't come to any answers, but my inquiry began, my search began. Then uh, two years went by, we got out of the camp, and once again, we went into barracks because uh, the British had bombed 72% of our city was destroyed with rubble, so back in the barracks. And here again, my mother showed her greatness. We were together in one room, five of us in one room, broken window, no heat, and uh, we had two bunk beds for five of us. And we were chattering. It was so cold. It was so cold that for most of the days, we spent 23 hours a day in bed. And there was one of those days we were chatting away. And my mother had the audacity to say, children, don't we have it good? <laughs> and we said, well, tell us about it. She said, this is the first time in two years that we as a family are together in one room. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> of course. Learn to appreciate what you have, as little as it may be. Then uh, we uh, ran out of food here and there. And my mother was very creative. She got a bag of English tea from uh, my Jewish grandfather, from her dad, who fled to England. Uh, doing the Holocaust, and so uh, she tried to trade the tea for a bag of potatoes, and no farmer would do that, no farmer. They all didn't have enough for themselves. So she actually was uh, made her way through the Iron Curtain, through all the Russian security guards with a bag of tea, and uh, she went from farmhouse to farmhouse, seeing if she would trade the tea for a bag of potatoes. No, 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 no. Every house the first day. She slept in the barn at night. Four kids back at home on the other side of the Iron Curtain. 
Then she, the second day, again, she knocked on doors, no, 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 slept in the barn again. The third day, finally, she got a bag of potatoes. She came home triumphant, and we were happy just eating potatoes for two weeks. And then we ate rotten tomatoes. But the atmosphere was always positive. We did not allow the circumstances to press us down. We stayed on top by staying positive, counting our blessings, as I said. So uh, then uh, we finally got to back into a, a apartment and so forth and so on, and uh, into a home, so to speak. And there was this memorable day when uh, at 13 years of age, I took my old bicycle out of the rubble of Hamburg. I'll show you a picture here. This is in my book. I don't know if you can see it or not, but the, uh, the rubble there, he's a man with one leg walking around here. That was my hometown. I rode my bicycle through all this rubble to get away from the destruction. I made my way into a forest to spend the night there. I had no tent. I had no blankets. I covered myself with pine branches for the night. <laughs> In the morning, the ants were crawling up my legs that woke me up. And then a nightingale sang a beautiful song. Oh, thank God. I had ears to hear, eyes to see. How wonderful is it? You have that stuff. And uh, then, as the golden beams of the sun came through the trees, I heard a voice speak to me in perfect German. And the voice said, Ich liebe dich, ich liebe dich, ich bin liebe. I love you, I love you, I am love. Wow! That's the first time at 13 years of age that somebody told me, I love you. And I want to tell you today, my friend, wherever you are, most of you at one time or another have cried on your pillow at night because of your broken home, because of drugs, because of the immorality, because of the mess that's all around you. I want you to know as God saw me, under those pine branches, a little bundle, 13-year-old kid. He sees where you are. And he has the same message for you. And that message is, I love you. I love you. I am love. And so, with that, a few years later, I stretched out my arms and I put my arms around the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now, let me leave you with three great principles. And uh, they are, number one, you must find out the purpose for your life. Are you just an animal that's evolved from the ape one step up? Or are you a person that was created for God for a special purpose in this life? And then do you have the kind of God who created you, dropped you on planet Earth, and then walked away from you like a frog walks away from the eggs he lays? <laughs> that frog doesn't care anything. Once he laid the eggs, he walks away from all his children. God, my friend, once he puts you onto this planet, he has a plan for you, he has love for you. He's there to help you to become what he wants you to become for the purpose that you were created. So, if you don't have a purpose, you'll drift all over from one thing to the other, and your whole life is a waste of time. Then, the other thing that I learned, never give up hope. No matter how dark it is, the sun will always rise. Just give it time. And thirdly, your destiny doesn't have to be dependent on the circumstances or on peer groups. Listen, the peer groups, generally speaking, 
have nothing to offer you but make you more miserable and drag you down. Be your own captain. Fly your own ship. Or <laughs> drive your own ship. So, make decisions. Make good decisions and wise decisions and you'll get somewhere. Now here is another memorable experience with my mother. The day came when she told me, Reimer, you will never amount to anything. You are good for nothing, lazy bum. Well, after she said that, I went into my closet. At the time, I slept in the closet on straw. I had one bed sheet for my cover. I pulled the bed sheet over my face so the mice wouldn't run over me, my face. And I began to do something, or I did something, that you kids, all you kids need to do. That is, once in a while, every day, to stop playing around with this thing. You need to learn to think and think and think and consider your life, your relationships with your father, with your mother, your school teacher, and everybody else in the school, all the other people. What are you doing to all these people? Are you a positive, encouraging influence? Or are you a negative? And so I decided from then on, okay, my mother said, I'll never amount to anything. I will prove to her, no way, I will prove to her that I will amount to something. And I would not let my mother determine my destiny for me, but I would take it in my own hands. And so, 40 years later, this young boy, now an adult, was flying a four-passenger airplane, successful pilot. I could fly above the clouds, in the clouds, in all kinds of weather at night. Flew my airplane right over O'Hare, Chicago, like a guppy amongst the sharks, the big planes all coming in from all over the world, from China and Japan and from Russia and Africa, <laughs> landing below me. <laughs> yes, I did succeed by God's grace in this and many other areas. So, summing it all up, here are the three principles I want you to write on a piece of paper and nail them or put them or stick them on your door of your room or the wall or someplace that will help you to keep your focus. Purpose, hope, and decision. Thank you for allowing me to share with you. I'd like to hear back from you, if possible. Goodbye.